teaching, as from Darius, Herodotus 7, 9, we shall bring all mankind under our yoke, the dream which Alexander would make less visionary, but which would only be actualized by the disciplined advance of Rome. In pride and sorrow, Thucydides records the Sicilian disaster. This was the greatest Hellenic achievement, at once most glorious to the victors and most calamitous to the conquered. They were beaten at all points and all together. All that they suffered was great. They were destroyed, as the saying is, with a total destruction. Their fleet, their army, everything was destroyed, and few out of many returned home. What could follow that wreck of the outward polis, its laws and values, but an inward, tragic fruit, as in the myth of Phaethon's fall in the garden of Euripides, where Phaethon's sad sisters by his grave weep into the river, and each tear gleams a drop of amber in the wave. We feel it in the one fragment of music left from Euripides as performed at St. John's by Terrio and Lynch. <laughs> or in Hecuba's poignant, almost justification. Had he not turned us in his hand and thrust our high things low and shook our hills as dust, we had not been this splendor and our wrong an everlasting music for the song of earth and heaven. In the Euripidean close of the century, the Erechtheum had caught in architecture the lyrical ionic yearning of the Hippolytus chorus of escape, which Gilbert Murray made a masterpiece of nostalgia. Could I take me to some cavern for my hiding, in the hilltops where the sun scarce hath trod? To the strand of the daughters of the sunset, the apple tree, the singing, and the gold, where a voice of living waters never ceaseth in God's quiet garden by the sea. But the frieze of the Parthenon, in the reverie of all ripeness, of all acme, had already reflected such moods, and it was with that outward betrayal and inward deepening that Socrates ended and Plato began. The seeds of the fourth century and of the Hellenistic and even of Hellenized Rome lurk in that 400 BC crisis the gilded youth of Athens gathered, as in the symposium, around the questioning Silenus Socrates, whose cloud house Aristophanes would burn, Silenus Socrates, to open, as votive statues did, to the platonic doctrine of ideas. Let that team of Plato-Socrates describe in the eighth book of the Republic what had happened in that Athens and would happen, as Thucydides says, as long as the nature of man remains the same. When a democracy has drunk too deeply of the strong wine of freedom, anarchy ends by infecting everything. The father descends to the level of his sons. The master fears and flatters his scholars. Old and young are alike, and all things are ready to burst with liberty. Such is the fair and glorious beginning, out of which tyranny springs. The people have always some protector whom they set over them and nurse into greatness. Some he kills and others he banishes, always stirring up war that the state may require a leader who is valiant, high-minded, wise, is the enemy. So freedom, getting out of all order, passes over into the bitterest form of slavery. Here, a Hellenistic king, perhaps Demetrius I, compliments the gilded youth, Alcibiades say, at the banquet of love. 
Let Demosthenes, trying to rouse the Athenians against the menace of Macedon, make the contrast of old and new. Hear the old in art, Theseus from Olympia. There must be some cause why the Greeks were so eager for liberty then, and now are eager for servitude. There was something which overcame the wealth of Persia and maintained the freedom of Greece, something the loss of which has ruined all. What was this? Simply that whoever took money from the corruptors of Greece was universally detested. But now all such principles have been sold as in the open market, and those imported by which Greece is ruined and diseased. Envy where a man gets a bribe, laughter if he confesses it, the usual signs of corruption. Art, courting that new private world, a fourth century marble after Lysippus. Conceive the pity of this degradation. Greek outwardness has become the platonic cave. Behold, human beings in an underground cave, chained, facing away from the fire and from the light. Figures bearing images pass behind them, and before them is a wall where shadows are thrown. They have lived there since childhood, prisoners as we all are. For them the truth will be nothing but the shadows of images cast on the wall of a cave. So the late classical search is on how to rise from the cave of matter to the light. Though as long as power operates in pagan forms, there will be the stern duty of return to the cave, the paradox and pathos of the human lot. But it is not the tragic paradox which enfleshed and worshipped dangerous divinity. This fifth century Hera, unveiling herself on her wedding night, mysterious as the destroying Aphrodite of Sophocles Antigone, Yeats. Overcome, O oh bitter sweetness, inhabitant of the softer cheek of a girl, the rich man and his affairs, the fat flocks and the fields' fatness, mariners, rough harvesters, overcome gods upon Parnassus, overcome the Empyrean, hurl heaven and earth out of their places, that in the same calamity brother and brother, friend and friend, family and family, city and city, may contend by that great glory driven wild. Pray I will, and sing I must, and yet I weep. Oedipus' child descends into the loveless dust. It was exactly that ambiguous divinity that Socratic and Platonic reason objected to. No paradox, no cruelty in the divine. So the world cleaves into tawdry outwardness, the itch of passion against the soul's search, that leaning of the alone to the alone. What was once full of spirit has become counterfeit, the Homeric hunt of the Corinthian seventh century jug, Odysseus telling of the boar's gleaming tusk that ripped his leg while he hunted Parnassus with the sons of Autolycus, turns in the Hellenistic Alexander sarcophagus for all Aristotle's validation of imitated sense and passion to one of the vigorous exertions of the cave, the skilled mimesis of a slaughter yard, a shambles. The glow of Alexander has filled Hegel and all with raptures, but in the mosaic copy of the fourth century painting of his battle with Darius, we are again thrown into the cave realm Arnold would write of, and we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. How much more with the Hellenistic cult of the ugly, Apollonius Boxer, the Louvre dwarf, the Capitoline old woman. What does the just soul do in such a state? One would like to legislate, of course, to save the country as well as oneself. That was what sent Plato on those bootless missions to Sicily. But Socrates had already given the pensive description and example of what was to come, comparing the philosopher in an evil time to one fallen among beasts. 
who, seeing the madness of the many and that no politician can be honest and no champion will defend justice, is like a man who, in a driving storm of dust and sleet, retires under the shelter of a wall, content if he can live his own life pure and depart in peace and with fair hopes. In the Euripides fragment, what is transcribed as chromatic was perhaps in the enharmonic or quarter-tone mode. The haunting phrase, with two indicated instrumental entrances, unison to fifth, conveys a style of passion, expressive as the robe of this 410 post-Fidian Nike. <laughs> As that agitation dominates the Hellenistic, it often reappears, thus the 180 BC victory of Samothrace. It relates to the Dionysiac art of Scopus, suggested in this 4th century cinerary crater from Macedon. As also in Hellenistic portraits of Alexander, pursuing the ardour of Leocaris. The most ambitious piece of Greek music that survives is the first Delphic hymn of the second century, which with its original accompaniments must have been a rich display piece, with chromatics in the last section like those of the Euripides chorus. Nothing will revive the wealth of Greek music, not even a private 1930s recording of the melody by Mr. Butt. But with such images as we have seen, it may be our best hint at one of the great emotional delights of the Platonic cave. The words are post-Pindaric of the shrines of Greece. <laughs> Of course, with this school of Pergamum Alexander, we are again in the cave which outwardness had become, swept with confused alarms. Plato had sketched Republic Nine, the fate of the tyrant, the man Thrasymachus had called happy. He is in his waking state what others are in their worst nightmares, enslaved, friendless, afraid, and mad. Against it we project from the lifetime of Plato, the Demeter of Cnidos, to keep up the oscillation over the gulf of wider cleavage from the more futile frenzy of action.